good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining either online or in person our nano seminar series. As you already know, this is a joint effort between the Nanomedicine Lab here at the University of Manchester and also the Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology in Barcelona, the ICN2. And before we welcome our keynote speaker, Professor uh, Simona Barinello, um, I'm very happy to introduce you to uh, one of our junior researchers, uh, Dr. Anita Liu, uh, to kick off uh, the seminar. So Anita is a postdoc in the nanomics team at the Nanomedicine Lab, and uh, she will give us a talk on the use of nanotechnology for glioblastoma uh, biomarker discovery. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Anita. I'm a research associate in the Nanomedicine Lab, and it's my great honor to open up the seminar for you by presenting my postdoc research using nanomics for blood biomarker discovery in glioblastoma. So as we all know, glioblastoma is the most aggressive uh, primary brain malignancy in adults. Um, and current diagnosis uh, approach has their own limitations. MRI has the detection limit and the tissue biopsies only allow sampling at either resection or post-mortem. On the other hand, liquid biopsy has their uh, own advantage. They have shown great promises in many cancer types. Um, they are fast, non-invasive, they could allow early cancer de detection, treatment, monitoring, and more importantly, they could provide a dynamic reflection of the disease rather than a static snapshot. So in GBM, we could utilize uh, liquid biopsy biomarkers in multiple, disease, uh, multiple stages. So we could use it for early detection and diagnosis. We, after the resection, we could use it for disease monitoring, uh, uh, for radiotherapy or chemotherapy. And uh, because GBM has a very high recurrent rate, we could even use it for um, early detection of recurrence uh, or, the uh, or the differentiation of actual recurrence with a pseudo progression. So the idea behind it is uh, with the GBM tumor progress, um, there will be increasing uh, permeability of blood brain barrier. And we could identify the uh, biomarkers that's been shed from the tumor into the blood circulation. And many types of the analyzes have been uh, identified by the literature in which the tumor uh, circulating tumor cells and cell free DNA has been a great interest. However, they have a vanishingly low abundance in the blood. So um, their characterization and analysis is still very challenging. On the other hand, proteins, as we all know, are the biological endpoint for uh, many cellular processes. And they are also the most established biomarker uh, analyte in cancer diagnostics. However, the, the discovery has been greatly hindered by the masking effect of other highly abundant proteins in the blood, for example, albumin. So to address this issue, we in the nanomics team using the nano nanomics pipeline utilizes the spontaneous interaction between the nanoparticles with a uh, blood biomolecules to form this a layer of biomolecule corona. And after the recovery and purification of the co corona coated nanoparticles, we analyze them by SDS page and mass back, where we can see this massive reduction of uh, albumin masking and the appearances of low abundant, low uh, molecular weight proteins. This approach has been successfully applied in multiple uh, preclinical and clinical human clinical studies to help us discover uh, novel blood, blood biomarkers. So in my research, my aim was to integrate the established pipeline with uh, brain tissue proteomics that hopefully will unveil GBM specific protein signatures and their underlying molecular pathways in the GL261 mouse model. So uh, I aim to achieve uh, like by building on the um, existing technology, I aim to develop a blood to brain integrated pipeline, use this to track uh, GBM specific signals in blood in the longitudinal GL261 GBM model. And finally, to identify key potential blood biomarkers for further validation. So my experimental design was to intracranially inject GL261 cells into C57 mice and to collect the blood in this, at this three time point uh, using the nanomics approach to uh, recover protein corona. And at the same time, we also collect the brains from this three time point 
using the uh, blood proteomics analysis and then do mass spec readout for both to allow the integrative analysis. Um, so first I characterized the model by histology where we saw the increase uh, tumor volume uh, during the disease progression. And to allow the nanomics, uh, to do the to perform the nanomics pipeline, we intravenously inject nanoparticles, wait for 10 minutes to allow in vivo uh, incubation, and then recover the blood, purify the, nano, nano, uh, the protein corona. Um, so the protein binding evaluation was done by BCASA, where we saw the increased amount of proteins bound to the nanoparticle at day 18 in GBM mice compared to the control. Next, we performed a uh, mass spec for all of these protein corona samples. And at day seven, we identified 115 differentially abundant proteins. And the majority of these proteins, as you can see, are upregulated in uh, GBM mice. In day 14, this number increased to what, 206. And again, the majority of them are upregulated in GBM compared to control. And uh, at day 18, we also observed a slight increase in the total number of proteins identified, and the, amount, the number of differentially abundant proteins has doubled to 417. To conclude this, we have uh, observed uh, more GBM-specific biomarkers in blood uh, during the uh, GBM progression. And we're also very happy to see the nanomics approach could uh, help us identify GBM-specific proteins in blood, even at a very low tumor burden stage. So next, we wanted to look at the longitudinal fluctuation of all these blood proteins. So we plotted all the, prote uh, the protein abundance of all the day seven differentially abundant proteins, and then to track what's the uh, abundance change in at day, eight, at day 14 and day 18. So what we saw was a gradual decrease in the blood concentration for these uh, group of proteins uh, during the GBM uh, progression. So we did the same for the day 18 proteins, plotted the abundance and to track back to see what's the abundance changing at day seven and day 14. And on the opposite, we saw a gradual increase for this group of proteins um, in the blood concentration during the GBM um, progression. To, so these results uh, showed us these two group of proteins uh, may reflect different mechanisms for the early stage established in GBM and also for the late stage uh, more um, established in the mature GBM. Um, so after the blood analysis, we focus on the brain tissue proteomics. To do this, we recover the brain, process them, and using the laser capture microdissection, microscope where we can draw the area that we are interested in and the laser will cut them for you. And the second video was to show after the dissected tissue how they've been picked up by an automatic picker. So next we digest the, um, the dissected tissue and do mass spec readout. So I have performed this analysis for all three, uh, for brains from all three time points. However, I will only present you the analysis we've done for day 14, where we dissected these three regions in the GBM brain. And we, by, uh, by doing mass spec, we wanted to see what's the regional characteristics of these three regions. So first, by comparing healthy with tumor tissue, we found 1,500 differentially abundant proteins. The majority of, uh, the majority of them are upregulated in the tumor. And next, we compare the healthy with paratumor region, where we found a lot less with around 500 differentially abundant proteins, with the vast majority are still upregulated in the paratumor region. And to compare these two graphs, you, we can tell the paratumor region we selected in this experiment are more closer to the healthy tissue than the tumor tissue. Lastly, when we compare the paratumor with tumor, we found around 1,100 differentially abundant proteins. So because of the nature of these three regions that we selected in this experiment, we wanted to see the, what's the spatial kinetics of these proteins across the transition of these three regions. So by plotting the protein abundance, what we found was the vast majority of these proteins 
follow a gradually going up or gradually going down trend across the transition of healthy to paratumor to tumor uh, region. Uh, apart from this, we also found a small group of proteins showed either the highest or the lowest abundance in the paratumor region. This group of proteins could provide us with uh, mechanistic insights on the GBM marginal zone. Last, we performed the integrated brain to, uh, blood to brain correlation analysis, where in the blood, the whole uh, 206 proteins, we found 67 was also upregulated in the tumor uh, region. And by plotting the abundance in the blood and the brain, we found the majority of these proteins focus on the left top right quadrant of this graph. This is to say that abundance are both upregulated in the blood and in the brain. And similarly, 61 was found in the paratumor region, and the same conclusion can be drawn from this graph. Lastly, when we compare all three regions together, we found 29 proteins that exist in all these three regions, and their abundance being highlighted in orange in the, in the graph. So by doing this analysis, we realized in the blood, almost half of proteins are also differentially abundant in the brain tissue. And these group of proteins will be our focus for the next stage uh, validation in human clinical samples. And also by doing um, pathway analysis, uh, we find we can we can see a uh, new metabolic and inflammatory related pathways uh, suggested by these group of proteins than uh, that were not enriched by analyzing all the blood proteome. So to summarize my work, uh, we the nanomics approach enabled identification of GBM specific proteins in blood, even at low tumor burden stage, and we will validate this in a transgenic model next. Um, and also we were able to longitudinally monitor the, GL, uh, the GBM specific blood biomarkers and to integrate this with brain tissue analysis to reveal key candidates for further validation. And lastly, the approach that we use, the untargeted um, proteomics of brain and tumor tissue has revealed this clear distinction between the transition of these three regions. This is to say these um, techniques could be more widely used to provide us with a, a mechanic, me, me, mechanistic understanding for the GBM tumor microenvironment. I would like to thank my supervisors, everyone in the nanomics, uh, in the nanomics lab, and also our collaborators at Salford Royal to provide me with the samples. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Anita. Any questions on Zoom, please, you can write them on chat and we will read them out loud here in Manchester. Any questions from the audience in Manchester? Thank you. Very nice. You. Um, I just had a question about, you know, when you're comparing the two brain regions, one has a tumor, the other one doesn't. Have you also done an experiment um, where you're just comparing left and right, but like in healthy animals, yeah. just like as a background sort of variation that you would expect? Yes. Um, so when we designed the experiment, I didn't in, uh, introduce in my talk, but we also have the sham injection control. So the sham injection, as in, instead of injecting tumor cells, we inject saline, which is the carrier of the tumor cells. And then we analyze what's the effect of the injection at different time points as a, ba as a baseline for my analysis. So the, when you filter out like your differentially expressed proteins, do you basically take anything that's above the differential yes. expression you would expect? So okay. those yeah. uh, say, those are mainly like inflammatory related. So they've already been taken out of the list. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Very nice talk. I just wondered, do you plan to go on to do any spatial proteomics or spatial to look at the actual cellular expression of the proteins in the brain? Um, so that would be a multi-dimensional like gen genomics or transcriptomics. Uh, but I think the near future, we will validate these candidates first before we think about uh, more like complicated analysis, but I think there'll be a very good angle to, to look at. Great talk. Uh, just to go back to the, um, to the first question, you're saying the controls are um, 
on some mice injected with saline yeah but but still struggling to understand why you're saying it's gbm specific um uh, what would be like the right control situation to justify that it is indeed gbm specific um would for example and um I don't know, grafting extracranially. What what would you expect um, in a situation like that? Well, uh, in the experimental design, we considered the factor that apart from having a tumor in their brain, they would age uh, across the, the 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 experiment, and they would have a basically have a surgery and then recover. So by having the sham control, we kind of exclude these two factors, but any other other comorbidities that comes with GBM, we, in this uh, analysis, we kind of count it as GBM associated, if that makes sense. So to, to what extent, for example, if, if, if you inject a an, different type of, of tumor, yeah. Um, or if you inject the GBM yeah, yeah. extracranially, to, to yeah. like, like yeah. how do you distinguish the proteins that are really specific for, for GBM? That's, that's why, so at this early stage, we're just trying to establish the pipeline, the methodology, and then we will use the, the transgenic uh, model to mimic a more realistic situation uh, where the tumor is like spontaneous. Uh, oh. Thanks, very nice talk. Um, just to follow up again on the specificity, I think um, at the late stage of your model, particularly when you're comparing to the proteins that are found in the brain to the blood, it's very convincing. But you did say at day seven that in the blood you think you may have a biomarker for, for the early occurrence of the tumour. Um, how specific is it there? I mean, there's many ways in which the blood-brain barrier can come disrupted. Um, how, how do you know it's not just proteins that are coming out from a disrupted blood-brain barrier at day seven? Can you do a control in a wild type where you cause blood-brain barrier disruption and look at what proteins you see in the blood then? Um, so we also think like in this day seven uh, stage, the blood-brain barrier is definitely not as as permeable than the, the late stage so that a lot of the blood changes that you observe could not be directly from the tumor it could be like a indirect kind of result of what's happening systematically with a tumor trying to establish its its own niche um, but again the 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 experiments were all compared to the same time point with the control animal so what's happening is yeah yeah no no i was just wondering whether you know for other diseases there's blood brain barrier disruption yeah how many of those proteins are going to be similar to yeah. the ones that you're picking up with your gbm at day seven so like i said um i think the many little would be strictly from the tumor cells into the blood circulation but the majority of them would be as a result of the tumor what's happening systematically Okay, so it's a great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Simona uh, Parinello. So she's a professor of neuro-oncology and the head of research department um, of cancer biology at the UCL Cancer Institute. And she also leads the Samantha Dixon Brain Cancer Unit and co-leads the CIUK Brain Tumor Center of Excellence. So Simona received her PhD at the University of California at Berkeley and she then moved to the UK to carry out her postdoctoral work uh, as an EMBO and Dorothy Hodgkin uh, Research Fellow. Uh, before she moved to UCL, uh, she first established her research group in 2011 at Imperial College London, and her lab uh, research uh, focuses mainly on adult uh, neurogenesis and brain cancer, with an emphasis, of course, on the cellular and molecular mechanisms that control uh, neural stem cell behavior in glioblastoma. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation and the introduction. Um, and thanks for joining the, 
of the seminar. So yes, so my lab uh, works on uh, glioblastoma. Uh, we're particularly interested in understanding the biological processes that drive disease initiation, progression, and recurrence. And we hope that by defining these molecular processes, we can identify uh, improved therapeutic strategies that are really rooted in the biology of the disease. So um, I will tell you today about uh, some still unpublished work um, that deals uh, particularly with the process of GBM infiltration. And if time permits, at the end, I'll touch upon uh, some published work that's relevant to it. You already heard about this uh, from the previous talk, uh, but as you know, glioblastoma remains one of the most devastating types of uh, cancer in 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 patients. It is an extremely uh, aggressive form of primary brain tumor, uh, which has devastating prognosis, which still remains uh, on average at about 15 months and has not really improved over the past 15 years. Uh, this is largely because the standard of care treatments that we give all patients uniformly are largely ineffective. And this can be uh, seen, I lost my pointer, if I can in this um, sequential series of MRI scans, we can see that the tumors which are aggressively resected and then treated with chemotherapy and radiation initially respond, but very quickly they go on to form a recurrent lesion, uh, which ultimately kills the patient. So why is GBM so resistant? Well, there are many uh, reasons for that. Uh, some of them are listed here, but uh, one probably one very important cause is that we know that the GBM is rooted in a subpopulation of cells that has stem cell features. And these are often referred to as glioma stem cells or stem-like cells or GSCs. And uh, we know that these cells, similar to their normal neural stem cell counterparts, uh, are able to propagate the tumor, to reinitiate it. They've been shown to be highly resistant to chemo and radiation intrinsically. And they're also known to recapitulate developmental programs of migration and brain infiltration. And so it is largely thought that it is um, mostly the stem cell nature of the cells that leads to the, to the cells that have migrated past the resection margin to resist chemo and radiation and go on to reform a secondary tumor. Um, so in, with respect to this ability of the cells to infiltrate, uh, this is really one of the major hurdles to uh, 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 so, sort of um, uh, um, achieving a complete uh, cure. And this is probably exemplified quite well in, in uh, this image, which comes from one of the mouse models that we established from the disease. So you see here, the tumor cells are labeled with TDO tomato in red and the normal brain is stained with DAPI. And you can see that the tumor is incredibly infiltrative in nature. So if, if you can imagine that this is the bulk of the tumor, the main tumor mass, and this is probably the area that would be mostly resected at surgery, uh, there is a very large number of cells that are left behind following this process. And these cells have infiltrated in many regions across the brain. And uh, when the cells do that, they actually encounter many different environments. So if you can imagine the cells within the bulk are found in a very hypoxic, necrotic, inflamed microenvironment, but actually the cells that migrate away from the bulk of the tumor are exposed to a very different microenvironment, which is more like the one of a normal brain. And observations from our own models also suggest that it, it really matters where they go within the brain because in different regions of the brain, they take on very dis distinct morphology Apologies that you can appreciate for with this uh, tidomato reporter, for example, cells in the cortex versus cells that invade into the striatum or in the white matter. So these very different microenvironments would be predicted to have a differential impact on the tumor cells it, from the bulk versus the ones of the margin. However, what's remarkable is that despite these, these distinctions and the fact that we know that bulk and margin regions are very heterogeneous regions, the vast majority of the research that has been carried out uh, over the last few years on GBM is really concentrated on trying to understand the biology of the bulk of the tumor, so this region here, whereas we know a lot less about the biology of the margin of the, of the tumor. And if we think about this microenvironmental impact, this is particularly relevant in the context of what I just told you, which is that the tumor has stem-like properties. And so if you compare side by side a normal neural stem cell to a glioma stem cell, there are similarities. So such, such as, for example, in their ability to differentiate. So if you think about the neural stem cells are known to, to generate uh, glial progeny, such as astrocytes and oligodendrocytes, as well as neurons, 
And we know from a series of studies, including single cell RNA sequencing from patient material, that in the GBM uh, situation, we have similar differentiation trajectories that give rise to more differentiated uh, progeny from the glioma stem cells that have neuronal associated oligodendrocyte-like features, as well as a fourth uh, phenotype that has been described as mesenchymal and has uh, links with injury. Um, so we know that the glioma stem cells can progress down, down a differentiation path that mimics to some extent uh, normal development. But what is it the impact of the normal brain microenvironment on this process and this response, particularly at the margin? So we really were interested in the lab to understand how does the microenvironment of the brain, particularly during infiltration, affect the ability of the glioma stem cells to differentiate? Or conversely, how does it affect their behavior more generally? Is there an impact? And if so, what is that impact? And so one problem uh, that one has when they study this, this, uh, this process, the infiltration and the margin of the tumor, is that actually it's quite difficult to study this uh, region in, uh, from patient material because by definition, this is the part of the tumor that is not resected uh, from uh, the brain of, of patients. And so it's not accessible for, for researchers to study, or at least it's rarely accessible. Um, and therefore, and it's also highly contaminated with normal brain cells. And it's difficult to know uh, with, with a certain degree of certainty if you're looking at tumor cells versus normal cells. So one way, of course, it has been done to some extent, and there are some studies, but they're also confounded by the fact that GBM is highly highly heterogeneous at the molecular level. And so with the scarcity of material and this heterogeneity at the molecular level, it's quite difficult to make robust conclusions about how, for example, genotype affects phenotype and what is the impact of the, um, of the brain uh, of, uh, on, on infiltrating tumor cells. So, so to overcome some of these challenges, what we spent a lot of time doing in the lab in the last few years is to develop a series of new uh, mouse models of the disease. And we wanted a model that would be highly tractable, that would allow us to directly link genotype to phenotype in a controlled manner. And so what we decided to do is to, de to develop models that would be somatic. So it would not require an excessive uh, amount of uh, breeding and uh, use of transgenic models, but actually based on a, a more simple tool, which is a piggyback transposition technology. And this is shown in these um, representative schematics of the construct. So what we did is basically we use a combination of piggyback trans transposition technology and CRISPR-Cas9 based gene editing. And this is a really powerful system because it consists of basically two plasmids that can be engineered in vitro to put in any combination of mutations that you would like, um, and then delivered to the mouse brain uh, using a simple injection followed up by electroporation. So the way this works is that you, you introduce your mutation of choice. So we have decided to mimic the three main molecular subtypes that have been described in patients, which are known to be either driven by EGFR. In our case, we chose EGFR V3 combined with CDKN2A, uh, a model driven by NF1, which should be more of a mimic of a mesenchymal-like subtype, and a model driven by PGFR, which would be more of a mimic of a proneural subtype. And so the, the mutations are all contained within the backbone or the piggyback vector. And then this is co-electroporated with a transient vector, which will not be integrated, but carries the, the piggy base, which allows for the piggyback to integrate in the recipient cells, and a Cas9 enzyme, which allows for the, the guide RNAs to delete the tumor suppressors of interest. And so we then co-inject these vectors into the ventricle of postnatal mouse pups, and we electroporate the brain so that the vectors are um, integrated or they're taken up by the cells. And by doing this in the lateral ventricle of the pups, we ensure that only the neural stem cells are targeted. And this is doubly ensured by where we deliver it and the fact that we place the expression of these construct constructs under a neural stem cell specific promoter. So as you can see here, the vast majority of cells that become labeled with TD tomato are cells that have radial glia morphology are not S100 positive, and they have the characteristic uh, morphology and markers of neural stem cells. So in this way, we can basically deliver our mutations to normal resident neural stem cells of the brain and observe their transition from normal cells to tumor cells. And um, this gives rise to tumors, as I will show you in a second. But what is really uh, nice about this is that 
through simple cloning techniques, we can further manipulate these constructs, for example, to knock out or, or express genes of interest, depending on the mechanism that we find. We can also introduce reporters, um, a functional ones. So in the basic version of these constructs, we simply introduce TD tomato to be able to visualize and track the tumor cells, which is particularly relevant to the margin of the tumor, where we know that the tumor cells are sparse and intermixed with normal cells. So this is the model, and we were very excited to see that it actually works. So we can generate tumors with um, histological and molecular features of GBM with all three uh, constructs, so with me making the three different subtypes. And these give rise to uh, lethal uh, terminal tumors um, with a range of latencies that range between 70 and about 110 days. So it's not super short and it's not it's so ridiculously long that it takes a year to complete a single experiment. So now that we had this model, then we could tackle, begin to tackle the question of uh, what do margin cells look like and how are they regulated by the microenvironment? And so a former student in my lab, uh, Claudia, decided to uh, take on this project. She actually developed all the constructs for the model. And um, what she did is using the fluorescence coming from the TV tomato reporter, she micro dissected uh, under fluorescent guidance, the bulk of the tumor. So the more uh, compact main mass of the tumor, which would be corresponding to the, the, the part of the tumor that is resected at surgery in patients and the infiltrative margin. And we focus on one specific region of the margin, which is the uh, striato invasion, which would be mostly corresponding to gray matter regions, uh, because we uh, knew that the heterogeneity of the tumor uh, of the brain might have an impact and therefore we wanted to have a very consistent and uh, standardized approach. She then used the TD tomato uh, reporter to fax sort the cells and profile them using RNA-seq. Um, at the time we chose to do SmartSeq uh, because we wanted to have a deeper analysis, molecular analysis of these cells. And so what did we find? Well, the first thing we did is we looked at how, whether or not the mutations we were putting into the tumor had any impact on the behavior of the cells, not just at the margin, but more generally. And this is was actually quite surprising what we discovered is because this is a, a UMAP from all the cells of all the regions and all the models combined. And you can see that the three uh, tumor types are labeled with different colors. And you can see that the colors are all intermixed with one another. And uh, these colors, uh, you know, when we do look at the clusters, actually, that make up this distribution, we see that there are specific cell types that mimic normal neurogenesis. This is not surprising because we're transforming neural stem cells, which we know are, in many cases, the cell of origin for the disease. And they mirror quite well what has been reported for uh, patient material. So we basically recapitulate different degrees of differentiation of oligodendrocytes from OPCs to immortalized to um, uh, immature to mature oligodendrocytes, uh, astrocyte progenitors and astrocytes. We also see cells of, of more neuronal fate that would be more similar to the transit amplifying progenitors that we see in the subventricular zone. We see a population of active uh, neural stem cells, which would be actively proliferating uh, neural stem cells. And we see a, a, a group of cells here in purple that is quite similar to what has been described as the mesenchymal or injured state. So we see all these populations, but we see them in all three genotypes, regardless of what mutations we put in. And not only that, but they're all intermixed. So what this tells us really is that the, the driver mutation doesn't have a major impact on the phenotype or on the be behavior, at least the cellular state, because they all converge onto a finite set of states that are really dictated by development and that are also dictated by injury to some extent. Um, so that was a bit of a surprise, but but then, of course, the main question was, what about differences between uh, the bulk and the margin? So that's what we looked at next. And um, again, this was a bit unexpected. So when you look at the different cell populations that we found within the tumor, we see that many of them are equally distributed between the bulk and the margin. So the bulk is in gray and the margin is in red. Uh, but there, there were two main exceptions, and one was that cells with astrocytic features were much more enriched in the margin, so at the infiltrative edge of the tumor, whereas cells that had this injured phenotype or mesenchymal that I will talk, uh, refer to as injured neuroprogenitor state, they were much more enriched within the bulk of the tumor. And this is shown just in a different way. Here you see the green is, is really much more pronounced at the margin, 
and the purple, which is the injured state, is much more pronounced in the bulk. And what was interesting about this injured state as well is that when we looked at the proliferative rate of all these different subpopulations, the, the injured cells were among the least proliferative. So this would suggest that in the bulk of the tumor, we have a more injured phenotype of less proliferative cells, whereas at the margin, we have more of a developmental differentiation path that leads to formation more of astrocyte-like cells. So can we validate this? So um, we did that. So this is just a, sort of like a marker validation of these findings. And you can see that if we look at markers of astrocytes uh, and we quantify the percentage of cells that have them in the bulk of the tumor or in the margin of the tumor, we see that there is a significant enrichment for these astrocytic-like cells within the margin, whereas in the bulk, there are much, much fewer. And conversely, if we look for markers of this injured or, or mesenchymal state, uh, many of these are uh, antigen presentation um, um, and, uh, proteins. We see them enriched in the bulk over the margin. So the, the results of the transcriptomic analysis were really uh, confirmed at the protein level. We see these different uh, phenotypes, which suggested to us that actually uh, tumor region is more important than mutation in driving the phenotype of the tumor cells within GBM. So we were intrigued by these observations. We wanted to understand uh, the functional level, how they come about and what, what are the drivers of this. So we started by asking the question, are these, um, are these differences uh, intrinsic or are they driven by the microenvironment? So our observations would suggest that they are microenvironmentally driven because depending where you are, you have these different phenotypes, but can we test that functionally? And so we decided to start to do that by simply taking cells, um, purifying cells from, the, from a mouse tumor, uh, isolating them in vitro based on the fluorescent reporter, uh, subculturing them for a very brief amount of time until we got uh, neurostem-like cultures, um, so uh, GSC cultures. And then we injected these in a slice culture model. So we can culture slices from our mouse models in vitro for several weeks. Um, and so we would have a live tumor growing in a dish. And then we can micro inject these tumor derived primary cells into either the bulk region of these organotypic slices or in the contralateral hemisphere where you would have a more normal um, brain um, environment. And so we asked is this now having a similar impact to what we see in the in just when we characterize the primary tumor? And the answer is yes. So when we look at markers for the um, injured or associated fate, we see that these are very uh, nicely reproduced. So this is quantified here. So if you look at, uh, uh, for example, CD44, which is one of these injured mesenchymal markers, uh, we see that this is much higher when the cells are injected into the bulk of the tumor. And this also corresponds with the cells having uh, being less proliferative compared to the contralateral injections, which would be down here, which are much less positive for CD44 and also more proliferative. And the opposite is true when we look for astrocytic markers, in this case, GFAP, you see that the, the cells injected into the more normal brain, which would mimic the infiltrative region, are much more astrocytic than their bulk counterparts. So this would suggest that these phenotypes are locally imposed by the region uh, of the tumor. So in the bulk, you have this inflammatory environment which drives this injured state, whereas in the margin, you have this more normal tissue that drives a more of a differentiative response towards astrocytes in particular. So what's going on in the bulk? So one of the things that we noticed that I told you before is that these injured cells were actually uh, very lowly proliferative. And so we, we began to think that maybe this, uh, this low proliferation is a readout of dormancy. And it is possible that uh, this injured state actually e equates to a dormant state within GBM. So dormancy, of course, is one of the reasons why um, therapeutic treatments don't work because the tumor cells don't divide very actively and therefore do not respond, for example, to chemotherapy. Um, and in, in general, I guess the assumption in the field is really that dormancy corresponds to a neural stem-like state that is observed in normal neurogenesis and recapitulated in the tumor. But actually, if you think about it, these tumor cells contain mutations that would inactivate cell cycle checkpoints, and therefore it would be unlikely that the same controls that occur in neurogenesis would be there in the context of the tumor to induce this quiescent state in the same way that you have in a normal brain. And so we hypothesize that maybe actually this injured state is the dormant state. 
So we can test this in our, in our system because of, of the versatility of the piggyback um, model that I told you about. And so what we did is we introduced alongside our mutations, a reporter of label retention in our model. And so this is based on the H2B GFP system. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but basically it's an inducible system uh, with, based on um, TET um, activation where uh, the tumor can be made to express H2B GFP in all tumor cells. It looks a bit like this. Actually, this is the final image, but all tumor cells turn green, uh, green nuclei, um, as a result of administering doxycycline to the mouse. Then you remove doxycycline and the cells begin to dilute out the GFP for normal H2B, histone H2B, and therefore they turn off the green fluorescence. However, the cells that divide very slowly will retain the green fluorescence for a lot longer than their actively dividing counterparts. And that allows you to identify and characterize molecularly these dormant or label retaining cells. And so we did that in our tumors and we were able to confirm that indeed there's a lot more label retaining cells in the bulk versus the margin. So this suggests that this dormancy induced at least by injury is a bulk specific effect. And furthermore, when we looked at whether these uh, label retaining cells were indeed the injured state, we found that this was the case because they were actually highly enriched. The GFP cells were versus the non-GFP cells expressed much higher levels of these injury markers. And as expected, they were low proliferative. And we went a, a step further by um, sorting the GFP cells from the tumors and subjecting them to a single cell RNA sequencing. And when we compare the GFP versus non-GFP, we see in, in fact that the GFP cells are, are highly enriched for these injury markers, um, and they're also enriched for signatures of dormancy and quiescence. So this really confirms this hypothesis that dormancy in GBM for a large part uh, is uh, injury. So what drives this? We were interested to understand what is the cause for this. There could be many reasons why uh, an injured state uh, uh, you know, forms within the bulk of the tumor. So we went back to our um, single cell RNA-seq uh, data. And when we look at which pathways are enriched in the injured state, we see that the vast majority of them have to do with immunity uh, and immune cells. So we went on to do a um, immune profiling of our tumors, comparing the bulk and the margin and uh, as well as the contralateral hemisphere as a control. And this is for the EGFR model, but we saw similar things across the board. And what you can immediately see is that the bulk of the tumor is much more infiltrated by immune cells uh, compared to the margin, which instead more closely resembles the contralateral hemisphere. And this is true for every immune subpopulation that we looked at pretty much. So if we look at microglia, macrophages, um, they're more, um, much more present in the bulk. Microglia is the only one that it's also more enriched at the margin compared to the normal brain as was reported, but it's still much more enriched within the bulk of the tumor. And the same goes for NKT cells, for natural killers, CD8 and CD4 uh, T cells. So the bulk, even though GBM is known to be a relatively immune cold tumor, is still more infiltrated in the margin, which instead looks more like normal tissue. So is that relevant to our dormancy state? So we went on to look at the tissue level using antibody staining uh, for all the different immune subpopulations. And I'm just showing you here the T cells because they are the ones where we found a very strong correlation in spatial distribution between T cells and our GFP dormant label retaining cells. And so whereas there wasn't much association, when we looked at distribution of T cells and green cells, we found a strong association. So you can see this already by eye, but we then collaborated with uh, Imi Nguyen, who's a digital pathology expert, and using their methods of um, spatial um, and e e ecology and, and statistics, they were able to show that indeed there is a very significant correlation between where the T cells are and the GFP cells are, uh, suggesting that these dormant cells reside in T cell rich niches. So is that functionally uh, relevant? So we went on to look at that uh, and we did this in two ways. We first uh, looked at this in vitro. So we asked if we were to co-culture our tumor cells with T cells in vitro compared to our tumor cells alone, would this be sufficient to arrest the cells? And we found that that was the case. So you can see here, tumor cells alone divide more than when they are mixed with T cells, suggesting that the T cells can drive this dormant state. But maybe more excitingly, the same result was observed in vivo. So we can form 
are tumors in a nude uh, mouse background, which lacks T cells, as you can see here. So in the, in the nudes, there are no T cells. And as a result, we see a very strong decrease in expression of these injury markers uh, within the tumor, suggesting that indeed it is the, the presence of T cells within the bulk of the tumor that is driving the, the, the tumor cells into this dormant injury state. And uh, finally, we wanted to understand at the molecular level, what were the signals that were driving this. So from our uh, single cell RNA-seq, we noticed that along the immune markers, there were strongly enriched signatures for interferon signaling, which is released by T cells among other cells. So we asked whether interferon signaling was the signal by which T cells are driving dormancy. And we did, again, gain and loss of function experiments. Again, here we're using our label retention system, but we are producing the, the tumors in either a wild-type background or an interferon receptor knockout background, and then comparing the number of label-retaining cells between the two. And you can see that whereas we see uh, an expected amount of dormant label-retaining cells in the control mice at about 10 to 15 percent after a chase period, in the knockout, in the receptor, in interferon receptor knockout mice, uh, this number is strongly reduced, indicating that indeed interferon signaling is important. And we can also do the opposite um, experiment when we treat our cells, tumor derived cells, in vitro with recombinant interferons. We see that those are sufficient to arrest the cells. So it's a, it's, it looks like in the bulk of the tumor, T cells are driving. Um, tumor cells into a dormant state via interferon signaling in specific niches. But what about the margin? This is where I started all of this. So I told you that at the margin, the, the tumor cells tend to follow more of a developmental-like trajectory differentiation, which leads to them becoming more astrocytic. So what this would suggest potentially is that there may be loss of stemness at the, at the margin, meaning that the, the tumor cells lose their stem-like potential and become more differentiated. So we tested this in a series of, of different ways. We first looked at enrichment for stem-like signatures comparing uh, bulk and invasive cells. And actually, we didn't see any difference. There doesn't seem to be any difference or loss in stemness at the margin, suggesting that there are stem cells in both regions in, in similar amounts. So it's not that. So is that true? Can we validate that at the tissue level? And so we did that by, a, by exploiting the observation that the stem-like population within our tumors were the most actively dividing. And so we can give a very short pulse of EDU, which will we label cells in S phase, to the mice, and that will enrich for this stem-like population, and then look for their distribution within the tumor. And we, when we did that, we see that actually there are no real difference in proportion of EDU uh, cells within bulk and margin, suggesting, as I just said, that it's not a loss of stemness. Stem cells are present in both regions. And that makes sense because it is the margin uh, stem-like cells that would be predicted to regenerate a tumor following injury. So there should be stem cells there. But then if it's not that, then it must be something else. There must be a bias towards an astrocyte differentiation. And so if that's the case, Oh, sorry, this is just a uh, clonogenic assay um, where we compared stem cells derived from malkin and bargin in vitro, and we can see that, again, there's no difference in stemness. But so then there must be something else going on, potentially a bias towards uh, differentiation towards astrocytes. So we um, tested that by simply, again, taking the cells out of the, of the mouse and culturing bulk and margin-derived cells separately, and then um, inducing them to differentiate in vitro by removing growth factors. And you can see that whereas they both uh, gave rise to neuronal and oligodendrocyte-like cells in equal amounts, there was a much stronger propensity for the margin cells to form astrocytes, indicating that it's likely to be the case that the stem cells at the margin are more biased towards normal differentiation. So this would suggest overall that potentially the dual population of cells between the bulk and the margin may be functionally distinct the population of the of GBM. And this would have important implications for the way we think about the disease, because this would be cells with very distinct biological processes. And if we are thinking about GBM as a bulk disease, and we're then try to, trying to treat the, the, the recurrent tumor using bulk derived approaches, we may be missing the important actually 
properties and pathways to, um, to three. So to really understand if this is true and these are the diff functionally relevant differences, what we did is we re-injected the cells into secondary hosts. And so this is what these experiments are. So we purified tumor cells from the bulk of the tumor or the margin of a, of a primary tumor and then implanted them in secondary hosts. And what we found was actually quite remarkable. So this is the survival curve from those studies. And you can see that in both cases, the cells are fully penetrant in their ability to form a tumor and, and, and kill the mouse. So we got tumors in all 10 mice in each condition, but the margin derived tumors were much slower at forming at killing the mouse. It was a significant advantage um, uh, in, in, in survival. But more importantly, it was the morphology of the cells that was quite striking. So these are the bulk derived tumors. You can see that they're very much a bulk. So they're forming tumors that are very compartmentalized, that they're the infiltrating but nowhere near as much as the uh, margin-derived tumors, which instead seem to go everywhere and they don't seem to even form a bulk. And this is uh, very obvious as well when you quantify it. But what about at the molecular level? So we looked at that. So we took, uh, we looked at immune infiltration first, and we found that the bulk derived tumors were again, very immune infiltrated. So they had infiltration of microglia and macrophages, which were active. And they also had infiltration of T cells to a lesser extent. They also had markers of injury and mesenchymal state such as BSC2. Whereas in the context of the margin derived tumors, that was not the case. The cell, the tumors were much less infiltrated by immune cells. And more importantly, they had a very strong uh, bias towards astrocyte differentiation. Actually, we just couldn't believe how strong this was. Every single cell almost is GFAT positive and SOX9 positive. So much more so than in the, in the bulk counterparts. So it's clear that these differences that occur during the development of the disease are maintained. They are recapitulated when these cells are used to reform a, a new tumor. And uh, somehow they are remembered by uh, the tumor cells, which I think confirms this idea that margin cells are functionally distinct subpopulations from bulk cells. So um, this is just a summary of what I told you. Um, we found that bulk and margin um, regions display distinct neurogenic patterns and distinct new microenvironments. That in the bulk, there is uh, there are the, the injury-like pro programs dominate, and these are associated with immune infiltration and give rise to dormant injured-like progenitor cells. And um, these are the consequence of T cells coming into the tumor and uh, secreting interferon. Whereas in the margin, we have uh, an environment which is much more immune cold. It's more similar to normal brain. And in these regions, the tumor cells tend to, form a to, to follow a developmental-like trajectory that gives rise to astrocyte-like cells. And so I think what really this is saying is that the tumor region is a very important deter determinant of tumor biology, uh, it seems in our, in, in our models even more important than genetics, and that it's important to take into account these properties when we think about uh, treatments. So I don't know if I'm out of time, but probably yes. Mm. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll whiz through the last part, uh, which is published anyway. So um, Everything I showed you so far was about infiltration to the gray matter, because as I told you, we were looking at uh, striatal infiltration. But actually, you might have noticed when I was showing this slide at the beginning that, um, uh, that there is extensive infiltration of white matter and that these cells actually look significantly different from some of the other regions. So one of the questions we also had in the lab is, what does white matter infiltration do to tumor cells? Is this a very specific and unique uh, biology again? And so um, Lucy Brooks, who's in a very talented uh, senior postdoc in my lab, decided to explore this question. And in this particular case, she used patient-derived models instead of our mouse models. And so just to briefly go to the punchline, uh, what she did is she took uh, tumor cells from patients and labeled them with GFP, made the tumors form in immunocompromised mice, and then did a region-specific microdissection, comparing cells from the bulk of the tumor versus cells that infiltrate a white matter or a gray matter, so corpus callosum versus striatum. Because they were GFP, she could sort them and do uh, RNA-seq, which in this case was bulk RNA-seq. And uh, what she found is that actually the region of the brain into which the cells go is also very important. It's not just about margin and bulk, but it's also about where in the, in the margin you go. And so this is shown in this PCA plot. You see bulk is very different from infiltrative, but if you look at PC2, 
gray versus white matter also have an impact. And white matter cells have a very distinct phenotype, which our analysis showed was to do with the cells acquiring, which is here, uh, markers of oligodendrocyte-like differentiation. And these cells were also um, less proliferative, which would suggest that they were more differentiated. And in fact, uh, using a series of experiments, it died. There you go. Uh, so this is additional analysis from the data. She could really show that these uh, that the cells in the corpus callosum in white matter had progressed in differentiation towards a state that corresponded to roughly between a pre and immature oligodendrocyte state in normal development. They had taken on markers of these more mature oligodendrocytes, which was labeled by the transcription factor SOX10, which is a master regulator of oligodendrogenesis in normal development. And so she could show that this is indeed real at the tissue level. If you use SOX10 as a marker, you see very strong SOX10 expression in every region in which you find myelin within the tumor. This is GFP um, and the quantification from that. And these cells were low proliferative compared to the non SOX10 counterparts, suggesting that they had undergone a differentiation-like response. And we could validate this in, in patient material. So these are just uh, tumor cells that had infiltrated in white matter from, uh, I think we did almost 30 patients. And in almost all of them, we could see at least some regions or in which um, tumor cells had acquired substan expression in myelin and they were lowly uh, proliferative. And uh, what was very, I think, interesting from this study was uh, not just that this happens, we know that the cells are stem-like and can uh, acquire more differentiated states, but why it happens. And the reason why it happens, we found, is it ha has to do with white matter injury. So you can see this here. So this red is fluoromyelin, a, a dye for, uh, for myelin. And you can see that this is undetectable here. This is corpus callosum. It should be red, but actually it's gone. And this is the region where we have the highest number of uh, differentiated tumor cells, suggesting that differentiation happens in area of white matter dis disruption. And indeed, Lucy could confirm this using EM. Uh, she could see that in the in every area where the tumor had infiltrated the white matter, the white matter had become very disrupted. There was demyelination, axonal pathologies of various kinds. And it was in this region that the cells took on this differentiated phenotype. And not only that, but in these areas, when we looked at correlative light and electron microscopy, you saw in some cases the tumor cells were trying to wrap around and interact very closely with the axon as almost like they were trying to repair the damage that they had inflicted onto into this region in the first place. I don't have time to show you, but we had also gain of function experiments where we could show that if we injure the white matter, now that triggers the phenotype linking it very strongly to um, injury of the, of the white matter tracks. And then she was able to show that this phenotype is actually driven by SOX10. SOX10 is not just a marker for it, but it's a transcription factor that drives a differentiation response. So if we overexpress SOX10 in patient-derived cells, it drives expression of this myelination program in the tumor cells, such as you know terms like myelination, axon and treatment, and so on, all get strongly upregulated. And as you would predict from a phenotype of differentiation and reduced proliferation, this is actually a tumor suppressive response because if we overexpress SOX10 in the patient cells before we inject them in a mouse, this gives rise to tumors that are much smaller, much less infiltrative, and actually kill the mouse much more slowly. Um, and so it suggests that actually uh, ways of increasing this latent response which is a regenerative response. It's almost like the tumor is trying to repair the brain. If we could trigger this response pharmacologically, this may be beneficial for extending uh, patient survival. And so we attempted to do that at uh, the, the preclinical level uh, and identified a drug that was uh, identified in the context of um, a screen for multiple sclerosis. So it's called Pranlucast, and it's actually an asthma drug that has been shown to be able to um, differentiate uh, progenitor cells to oligodendrocytes. So we asked whether this would work in our tumor models as well and delivered this through osmotic mini pumps. And of course, this is preclinical studies, but it was very exciting to see that it had a very strong impact on the tumor. Uh, we could increase the proportion of cells that differentiated independent of where they were within the tumor. And this resulted in the tumors being much less proliferative, suggesting that it may be a way of decreasing uh, tumor load. Uh, 
And so just to put that together, what this data suggested was that you have a feedback loop whereby the tumor first infiltrates within white matter. This causes an injury to the white matter microenvironment that then feeds back to the tumor cells themselves, uh, inducing a latent repair program in these cells that makes them remember their stem-like and actually reactivate programs of oligodendrocyte-like differentiation and in an attempt to repair the damage they had caused in the first place. And this feedback loop is actually tumor suppressive. And if we can exploit it, it might be beneficial uh, for treatment. And this is just what I just told you. So I'm just gonna um, end here, just highlight the fact that I think a lot of our work is converging on this realization that injury programs play a very important role in the disease and help shape the phenotypes of the tumor and its progression as well as response to treatment. And uh, this is uh, my group, uh, just a special mention for Lucy, who did the SOX10 work, and Claudia, who has been a driving force in developing the tumor models, and my collaborators. And thank you all for your attention. If you have any questions, please ask me. Thank you so much, Simona. Excellent uh, talk. So any questions on Zoom first before we move to the audience? So we have a question on Zoom from Cyril Bussi, which is related to your first um, part of your talk. So it says, you mentioned cell memory. I guess you're alluding to epigenetic memory. Have you checked the, the methylome between the bulk and the margin cells? So we have not. And yes, that would be the first um, thought. Uh, it would be very interesting to look at that, but we, we have not. Um, we think it's probably related to cell of origin, which is the same thing in a way, but we, we haven't done that yet. Now this data is relatively recent. Questions in the room? Thank you, very nice talk. Um, I have two questions about your mouse model. So you express the piggy bag and the Cas9 from a GFAP promoter, right? As uh, only the Cas9 and the... Um, uh, the piggy, piggy base. the piggy base, the yes. transient one, yeah. Yeah, um, but ZFAP doesn't only stain the stem cell, it also stains differentiated astrocytes. Yes. Right? Uh, but it's uh, because we are injecting it in the ventricle, so in the in the ventricular cavity, really the only cells that can really pick it up are the cells that are very close to the ventricle, and those are the neural stem-like cells, which reside within one to two cell distances from the cavity. And so with this trick, you really minimize, you may have the occasional astrocytes, but the vast majority of cells that you target in that way are the stem cells. So, it's a, so in the, when you look at the margin, you did like SOX9, ZFAP, have you also done like um, S100 beta, for example, for a specific uh, differentiated astrocyte cleanness and you didn't see any? So we have done, uh, in terms of staining, we've only done, I think, um, GFAP, SOX9, and potentially glass. I think, and but at the transcriptomic level, you see a range of markers that are astrocytic uh, in, in that population. Is your question, are those really tumor cells or not? Or Yeah, just to make sure that you're not picking up any differentiated astrocytes. In that. We, may, it, we may do, but I think the reinjection experiments really tell you that it's not just about that because you reform a tumor, which is fully penetrant, and the majority of the cells are astrocytic, and yet they form the tumor that has killed the mouse, so they're clearly tumorigenic. Or they're <laughs> differentiated cells that went back, <laughs> which we don't know. Um, well, could be, but they're still yeah. tumor-derived. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other question is, um, so when you, you also, so you delete some genes and then you express on top of that your mutations, is that correct? In some context, I was just giving an example. So for different study where we were interested in um, fatty acid oxidation, we were able to delete piper alpha using an additional guide RNA, and then you, you form tumors that are deleted for that, and you can look at the impact. In this particular study, we didn't um, add any more genes except for the interferon, experiment, but that was an interferon knockout mouse. So we generated the tumor in that background. Does that make sense? Oh, oh so there were not any, because it was more technical, like um, how do you know that you have like a complete or successful deletion? Um, so for the tumor development, I think it's a selection process. What happens is you may have some cells that are not gonna be completely mutated, but those do not tend to form a tumor. So you ultimately then, have an intrinsic selection within the mouse that the fully transformed ones then go on to develop a tumor. And we obviously have taken the cells out and tested 
for their, you know, the presence of the mutation, that they're always there. Um, for when we do gain and loss of function, we do the same thing. We, we then test, we take cells out or we look at the tissue level to make sure that the gene of interest is deleted. It works very efficiently. I cannot explain it because when you do it in vitro, it's nowhere near as good as that, mm -hmm. but in vivo, it's, it's very powerful. Yeah, it was a surprisingly robust system. Yeah. Thank you for very fascinating and inspiring talk. Um, so your um, mouse model encapsulates nicely the um, clinical situation mm -hmm. um, where patients with a more mesenchymal type of tumor are doing worse. What at the end of the day are the mice and, and the patients now dying of? Is that the bulk that is growing or is that the edge that is developing in a macroscopic tumor? Because at the end of the day, they, they all die from a mass yeah. attack of the tumor. Um, because what you're showing, if I understood it correctly, is that the bulk is a more dormant, mm -hmm. a more dormant state. Well, not everybody, right? So there are also actively dividing cells, but you definitely have that dormant phenotype that we don't see in the margin, right? And that's a subset of cells. I think, I think that's really a fascinating question because at least for the mice, they either die because the tumor burden is just too much and the bulk is pressing on different regions of the brain. And you can see that with things like seizures and, and stuff like that. And that I think ultimately kills them. But the question is, why are the ones that are margin derived, which are just infiltrative? And we also have other models in which there is no bulk that forms uh, because we had done other genetic manipulation. And those live longer too, but eventually they die. And we don't really know, but obviously it must be that at some point there's just too many tumor cells there, even if you're not compressing on. But it's a very interesting question. I, I don't know what it is because I think it goes back to this idea if you were to you know, think about treating after after surgery with something that prevents a bulk from reforming and you keep them just in this infiltrative state. You will extend survival, but at some point there will still be death and blah, 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 why? I, I, I don't know, I would love to know. And I mean, related to that point, I mean, it is um, uh, from the data from, for example, Clohacy, um, for the, uh, new adjuvant versus the adjuvant immunotherapy, now the more recent, although there's a lot of limitations in the, in the study uh, from the DC facts, they hint towards the idea that patients need to have a significant amount of tumor on board mm -hmm. because it are those patients that seem to benefit. They're not necessarily doing better right. uh, compared uh, to the patients who don't have a lot of tumor on board. But if you compare the two arms, there is a trend mm -hmm. that patients with significant right. tumor loads yeah. respond somehow better to immune-related therapies. Yeah. Do you there think that this is part of the answer then? It's possible, I guess. I mean, I think it's also, I think what the data suggests is that it is a transition from a, a more immune cold to a more immune hot, relative, of course. Um, and so that I think that must have to do with numbers of cells. And it would be very interesting to explore what does it. Is it just because you're injuring the brain more and so you're allowing for more peripheral cells to come in, probably to some extent, but maybe not only. Um, so I think probably my guess would be yes, but I mean, it's just a hunch. Thank you, Simona. I'm, I have two questions. Maybe I have asked you, or maybe not. We're very relatively simplistic. The first one is all of your preclinical models, the one you showed us, um, are the source of tumorigenesis is in the ventricular mm -hmm. um, cavity. Is that, you think, a factor that determines development? If you were to generate those tumors in a different structure, mm -hmm. would you think that you would have a different outcome? So, I mean, the reason why we chose that 
population cells is because there's increasingly large number of studies that demonstrate that the neural stem cells of the SVZ are the most likely cell of origin. Of course, nobody knows, right? But uh, a series of, of mouse studies have shown that if you, for example, the same mutations from that first tumor showed, and F1, P10, P53, you only get a tumor if you deliver those to the neural stem cells and no other region in the brain. And there was a study in Nature a few years ago where they looked at uh, matched SVZ and uh, glioblastoma from patients, and they found the same truncal mutations in both, and they did a series of additional studies, which led them to conclude that the neural stem cells are the most likely cell of origin. And then, of course, there's additional complications because those cells then go on to differentiate more, so there is also a lot of evidence to suggest that OPCs may be a cell of origin, OPCs that derive from those stem cells, and so on. So the reason why we model it that way is because of this, um, and also because technically it's much more challenging to, to form tumors from other cells within the mouse brain. People have done it, but I think it's a more of a, a brute force approach. So mm -hmm. people have shown that you can get a tumor from a neuron too, but I think it doesn't really happen in real life. So if you express RASVAL12 or something, you might succeed. But, you know, um, so I think that's, uh, I think it's as good as it gets in terms of modeling. Yeah. Thank you. And the other question, which is even more simplistic, is we connects with what uh, Gerben asked you to some extent, is what is the impact of resection in this? Because if I understand correctly, and we've been discussing it a lot, is if I go and induce an even more severe uh, injury yeah. than what you are describing here, where more proliferation is encouraged, and recruitment of many different types of cells from systemic circulation, then I would expect you have a very different microenvironment generated there yeah, for sure. that is even more um, potentially conducive of um, more severe transformations. Um, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I think that would be the prediction. We are just starting to explore that. So, I so don't would you, what, what would be your hypothesis or intuitive positioning there? Well, I think what would probably be is that, you know, you have residual margin cells that have this more astrocytic fate, and then you go in there with all these injury responses that will like, change their phenotype. And the question is, are you then immediately switching them more to these injured ball forming state, which would also be a mesenchymal like phenotype? And if so, how does that happen? And, you know, uh, and what are the consequences? I mean, I think that's probably what the field is thinking about in general. We don't really have a huge amount of evidence yet <laughs> or a mechanistic understanding of how it works either. Any other questions? So I have a very perhaps naive question. So you show that the bulk is completely different from the marginal zone and you took cells and re-inject them to see how the tumor uh, change. So do you think the recurrent tumor then is completely different from the initial tumor? Because you know that sometimes clinicians will, surgeons will yeah. um, perform surgery twice. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think the tumors that are resected are completely different? So people have started to look at that. Uh, a few studies have come out. There's a glass consortium that have longitudinal collection of primary and recurrent. And I think that the, the data is quite um, heterogeneous in a way. So there is evidence for both being very different and being very similar and mutations being the same or not. So I think to some extent, the jury is still out, but there was a study uh, from uh, Barak's group not that long ago that I thought was quite fascinating where they showed that um, the majority of recurrences looked more diffuse and more neuronally and progenitor-like, which would be consistent with what we found in a mouse model. Um, but then the rest of it were mesenchymal. So I think you can have, I, the, the way I would interpret those would be that in some cases they have um, transitioned further towards this inflammatory state. And in the in the, the ones that were more neuronally, they're at an earlier phase of that stage, or they may never do, who knows, right? It also depends which part of the recurrence they would have collected as well, right? Because that's a big factor. So I think it's quite difficult to interpret the data and uh, so many factors would impact on the results. So, so yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, we should thank Simona one more time. Thank you very much for your nice talk and thank you for coming to the seminar.